This is Tanzania, East Africa, and this is the Varamba Troop. Forty yellow baboons that exist on a knife edge between life and death. Competition is fierce, yet they rely on cooperation and the wisdom of the female mind. This is Holly Carroll. She spent a year in their company, sharing their adventures and learning the secrets of their survival. I'd like you to meet three remarkable ladies I met this year. Katovu, the queen of the Varamba troop, whose dominance seemed to give her an aloof and superior air. Old Hashima, humble in her position at the bottom of the hierarchy, who was clever enough to guide the troop out of danger when their survival was most in question. And little Kabedi, who faced one painful catastrophe after another with amazing resilience. Me, I spent the most extraordinary 12 months of my life in their company. This is the story of the challenges we faced together in the African bush. Kitovu, Hashima, and Kibeti are all members of the Varamba troop of yellow baboons. Despite their familiarity with humans, they remain totally wild. Their home is a mosaic of floodplains, grassland, and wooded hills, stretching either side of the Tanzam Highway, which links the Tanzanian coast with Zambia. Holly has been invited by project director Guy Norton to join his volunteer research team in Makumi. She has a lot to get used to, not least the searing heat. Her passion is primates, but she's been working as a biologist in Alaska, studying salmon in freezing rivers. This is a very tough place to live. Holly is keen to get out and meet the troop. As always, the researchers will be accompanied by one of the project's two full-time rangers. Charles Kidungo has 27 years' experience of tracking and interpreting the baboon's behavior. He'll be responsible for much of Holly's training and her safety too. Over the years, he's had to scare off many lions, elephants, and buffalo that have come too close. He's never yet had to shoot to kill, but this is a dangerous place to be out on foot. My first day in the field was Angela's last. She'd come to the end of her two years of research, and it was up to me to learn as fast as I could so I would be a worthy replacement. Yeah, Holly. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, we just walked right in amongst them. It was amazing. They didn't run off. In fact, they weren't even a bit bothered about us being there, even the big males. Look, he's like, yeah. he's looking right at me. <laughs> totally unconcerned. Oh, and there's one one of the first things I had to learn was not to oh. stare directly into a baboon's eyes. It could be interpreted as a sign of aggression. We could watch, but not stare. So down here is the youngest infant we've got. She's about a month old now. This was my first meeting with Capetti, the only female baby so far this year. Back then, I had no idea what this cute little monkey would have to endure in the coming months. I was so excited about the year ahead, but it felt like I was doing my day's work in a sauna, and I wondered if I was really up to it. Those first few weeks were fun, but hard work. Getting to grips with the research work and all the jobs that went with it. Where to go for supplies. How to defend myself from dangerous animals. Mama Asha helped me with my Swahili, and housemaid Allison showed me how to cook with local food. Charles and William tirelessly taught me all the stuff I needed to know in the field. 
It's mid-April, and Holly's been at Makumi for two months. I've really settled in. I've gotten to know the baboons and their stories, and um, I'm learning the trees and the plants, and I'm seeing birds every day, and I'm loving my job. And um, to top it off, we just had a lion outside the shower. Allison's in the shower, so I'm coming to rescue her. Um, I've, I've shouted at her that there's a lion out there. Yeah, yeah, she ran into the bush. <laughs> she was just right there. It's those kind of experiences that make this even more unbelievable. The working day starts before five. The researchers have to be up before first light if they're to find the baboons before they move too far from their sleeping tree. Just getting to the sleeping site can take an hour or more. Today, Holly's accompanied by William. He knows every twist and turn of the baboon's range and seems to instinctively know the direction they'll be heading in. Without William or Charles, I'd have no hope of finding them. When food was scarce, they'd leave their sleeping trees early and could walk for many miles. But today, there was plenty of food, so they hadn't traveled far. In baboon society, you inherit your rank from your mother and keep it for life. At the top of the Veramba rankings is 12-year-old Kitovu. She has the most influence on the troop's day-to-day -day decisions. At the bottom is Hashima, a wise 17-year-old. Although lowest ranking, she knows the best places to go to find food and water. These two females, the most important in the troop, were both pregnant. Poor old Hashima. It was just as well she got to the food ahead of the rest of the troop. Once they arrived, she was relegated to feeding on the ground. Kotobu, on the other hand, could count on Hashima to find the food and then, explaining her status, stroll up and take her seat at the head of the table. The rich variety of foods available at this time of year offer all the nutrition the baboons need. The fruit of the marula tree related to the mango, is sweet, juicy, and rich in vitamin C. Protein comes from insects and grubs, if you can find them. On average, a baboon needs to eat the equivalent of 1,200 raisins a day. To pack in that much, they must forage almost constantly. But at this time of year, for a few short weeks, they're overwhelmed with delicious choices. What can't be wolfed down is tucked away in cheek pouches, rather like a doggy bag to be enjoyed later. And that leaves plenty of time to relax, unwind, and soak up the sun. It was great to see them enjoying so much food, especially Kotobu and Hashima. They needed to stock up while they had the chance. In a few months, when their babies were due, food would be scarce. Mikumi is no place for a solitary baboon. It's just too dangerous, and for much of the year the land is utterly unforgiving. So their best chance is to live together. Cooperation and shared knowledge are keys to their survival. Most decisions are made by the females, drawing upon years of experience. But while this might appear to be a cozy community, everyone must still look out for themselves. Also with the troop are a handful of males. Twice the size of the females, they provide protection from predators and other troops in return for sexual favors. For the rest of that week, the troop stayed pretty much in the same area, enjoying the fruits of spring. But next time I spotted Kibeti, she'd had her first brush with disaster. She had a horrible accident. Her tail was nearly severed, and the bone is actually jutting out of it, and we think that the bottom half is probably going to drop off because it's quite dead. The first two days, she was really crying a lot uh, after the injury happened, so I think it hurt to touch. But now I think it's dead because it's 
bumping against things and doesn't seem to bother her at all. With so few infant females in the troop this year, it's essential that Cabetti survives. If the female lines die out, the Faramba troop will cease to exist. This is because females born within a baboon troop stay with it for life. These young males, however, will leave when they're about eight years old. Breeding males will come from other troops, attracted to the adult females. It was cool and shady by the water holes, and at the end of a hot afternoon, everyone gathered to chill out. I loved these times. It was like a summer's day by the pool. So this is how life was in those first three months. Apart from Kibeti's accident, everyone was doing great. There was plenty of food and times were good. But it was all about to change. The next day, Hashima shot off in a completely new direction, leading us all straight into very long grass. A journey like this presents the troop with their greatest risk. It's difficult to spot a leopard in 10-foot grass when you're only 18 inches tall. For Holly and William too, this is an extremely dangerous time to be out on foot. I really don't like this long grass at all. It's, it's quite dangerous. You can't see for like three meters in front of you, and uh, I'm always worried that you're gonna see a buffalo or an elephant. Thank God William's there looking out for me, because I'm too busy just trudging. I wouldn't notice an elephant most of the time, and you can't hear. I just be so happy when it's going. They must move with extreme caution. Both Charles and William have known friends to be killed by elephants and buffalo in this long grass. Lions lurk, barely noticed. All the animals are on high alert. The baboons were really on a mission. They led us straight through the long grass for hours. I've no idea how they managed to stick together in all this, when even William and I were having difficulty. Despite having the advantage of walking upright. We finally arrived at a Sterculia tree. As usual, Hashima waited at the bottom while Katova went ahead. But why come all this way for one tree? And then I realized it wasn't fruit, but resin they were after. They'd clearly visited this tree before. They were all keen to get at it, but Rank determined whose turn was next. Poor Hashima. She brought them all this way and then wasn't allowed to get at the good stuff. They really weren't very nice to her. Resin is full of compounds, evolved to protect a tree against fungal and insect attacks. It's been used as a herbal remedy by humans for thousands of years. Maybe the baboons use it for its medicinal qualities. It's certainly appealing to injured little Gabetti. Or maybe she just likes its sweetness. Thankfully, Hashima got her fair share in the end. As the troop moved on, she hung back and found some resin for herself. Perhaps it would help her unborn baby. By the time she caught up, everyone was taking a rest from the midday sun. One of the females has come into season, and it's not gone unnoticed by a male from a nearby troop. It seems he fancies his chances, and he sets off after her. But a lookout from the Veramba troop spots the intruder and alerts his fellow males. In a rare display of solidarity, they close ranks. Faced with such opposition, the intruder may be seriously injured or even killed. While all this was going on, they didn't notice a much bigger threat sneaking up behind them. 
and neither did we. has chased them here before and now they're all on alarm right now if you look in the trees they're all looking in that direction <laughs> see look they're all looking that way <laughs> see i'd like to be in a tree right now looking somebody saw something it wasn't just a false alarm they were pretty distressed all that alarm barking served its purpose the predator was eventually scared off and the baboons finally decided it was safe to move on. I'll follow you. By this time, I was feeling quite edgy, so it didn't do my nerves much good when Hashima led us out onto the highway. Yet another danger to deal with. They didn't use the road too often, but today it felt like we were dodging one disaster after another. To the baboons, this is a perfectly intelligent choice. They sometimes use the road as a quick, direct route to a distant feeding area or sleeping site. Free of the long grass, they have clear visibility and can easily spot predators. In their eyes, they're safer here than in the bush. But Holly feels differently. The buses do about 120 kilometers an hour. Some of the trucks and cars go even faster. The baboons are really not safe here. As spring rolls into summer, the fierce African sun sucks the land dry, leaving precious little food and water for the wildlife of Mikumi. The summer fruits had gone, and the baboons had moved to the tamarind groves on the hillsides. Our daily hikes were becoming upwards of 10 miles and were much more tiring. There was very little shade and we still had the long grass to deal with. The fruit of the tamarind tree is one of the last remaining options. But even these trees are hard to find and the troop relies increasingly on Hashima's navigation skills to find them. The baboons eat as much as they can, replenishing their energy after the long walk. In spite of her accident, Kibeti was becoming quite a free spirit. Her tail had dropped off, just like we expected, and wasn't causing her any problem. But it worried me that she was still the only baby girl of the year, and that didn't bode too well for the future of the Varamba troop. More females were needed. It was Hashima who delivered. She gave birth to a beautiful little girl I named Wenzi, which means companion, because now Hashima wouldn't be alone. Wednesday automatically inherits her mother's low rank, but for the time being, they were the most celebrated couple in the troop. It was great to see Hashima getting so much attention at last. Everyone wanted to touch the new baby, but they had to ask her permission first by grooming her. It was the first time I'd seen them treat her nicely. But at the top of the troop, there's still no sign of Kitovu's baby. And after a few days, Holly and the rangers are becoming concerned. Well, Kitovu's overdue now. She was supposed to have her baby a couple days ago. I hope nothing's wrong. She's moving really slow today, and her rear end looks quite tired and she's scratching a lot. So it could be a good sign, and maybe she'll have it today or tonight. I'd really like to see it, though. So I'm sticking to her like glue. And I won't have a day off until I see her with the baby, which could be a while at this rate. With just the two babies, Mwenzi and Kabeti at the moment, the future is beginning to look bleak for the Varamba troop. Normally, at least half the adult females would have suckling infants. But then one of the mid-ranking females comes into season, sparking fierce competition amongst the males. 
All may mate with this one female, but priority will be decided by fighting. The most successful male claiming her at the end of the week when she's at her most fertile. These fights can be extremely aggressive, sometimes fatal. It was always upsetting to see them fight like this. It was like watching friends in a bar brawl. Jogu, a male who's been with the troop for four years, escapes the conflict by grabbing an infant. This is a common tactic. Another male will rarely attack if he risks injuring an infant that may be his own. Jogu is not a coward. He fights plenty of battles, but claiming an infant in this way is a privilege he's earned from spending many hours in the company of females. He's sort of like a grandpa to all these kids here. He's quite old, but he really likes the babies. And he usually goes and plonks himself down next to a bunch of the kids that are playing. Sometimes he acts a bit sort of crotchety and he'll smack them if they get too rambunctious around him, but he loves it. You can tell. And look at this. He doesn't have to tolerate that at all. The park is now tinder dry. It hasn't rained for five months. The few remaining water holes are widely scattered, and there's very little food for the baboons. They're walking a daily tightrope for survival. At this time of year, fires spring up all over the baboons' range. Some start naturally, others are started by the park service to prevent massive destruction by wildfires. For baboons, it's not usually a problem. They simply retire a short distance and wait for the flames to subside. However, six miles away at the house, a runaway fire is giving Holly real cause for concern. It's definitely coming this way. Actually, it, it really looks like it's getting quite close. And um, I don't know what to do. My mom's just laughing, so I guess that's a good sign. Um, but that is looking like it's on this side of the road now. Jeez. So should I be worried? <laughs> oh, please don't let our house burn down. Fortunately, the wind drops, and the flames are beaten by a hastily recruited brigade of volunteers. Liberated at last from the long grass and its threat of predators, the troop returns to enjoy their new freedom and indulge in the abundance of food to be found on the scorched earth. Nature has provided them with an easily spotted feast of barbecued insects and seeds. It couldn't have come at a better time for Kitovu, who's given birth at last. This is it. I mean, this is what we've waited for days on end for. Um, Toby finally had her baby. And to top it off, it's female. She's quite healthy, um, which is good. And I think she's quite small, but she looks like she's going to be a strong one. Um, so I'm really pleased. I'm going to name this new baby girl Chilewa. Because Chilewa is the Swahili word for late. And she was very late and was actually giving us a bit of a scare. So um, I think that's an appropriate name for the new princess, Princess Chilewa. It's an important day for the troop. If Chilewa survives, she will one day inherit her mother's top rank position. A few hundred yards away, a small herd of elephants forages in the morning sun. Like the baboons, they've been drawn here by the remaining fruits of a solitary tamarind tree. William lets them know they have human company. The baboons don't mind the elephant right now, but if the elephant wants to scare them off, she will. Um, sometimes they can be quite mean to the baboons and just sort of run them off. I don't think they like them around. 
they'll actually chase them and trumpet at them, and the baboons will keep quite a distance. But right now, they're just, they're fine. I think they just want the salmon. But if she wants that tree, she'll have it. I'm getting out of here now because she's not, okay, she's not very good. Okay, so she just sort of chased us off there and she started advancing, her ears came out and that was a good warning sign. And it worked, we ran, the baboons ran and now she's got the tree. So uh, good communication on her part and uh, good action on ours, I think. One thing that really plagued us in Makumi was the ticks. They covered our legs as we passed through the grass and then once they'd worked their way inside our clothes, they'd suck our blood, leaving itchy bites. Being so small, it was hard enough for me to find each one. It must have been so much harder for the baboons with all that hair. <laughs> Every dot you see, these are all ticks. That's a lot of ticks. I've got a few hundred on me currently. This is the worst I've ever had yet. It's not a huge deal, as long as they don't actually get inside the clothing, which doesn't look like they have. That's actually just leg hair. Oh, there's one. And that's the joys of working in the bush. Grooming is one of the things Holly's been studying as part of her research. Not only is it an essential means of removing ticks from inaccessible parts of the body, it's also the way in which a baboon socially ingratiates itself, forging friendships that may later prove useful in avoiding conflicts. Since giving birth to Mwenzi, Hashima has received a lot of grooming attention. She rarely gets any peace these days, such as her baby's popularity. Kitovu, by contrast, is pulling rank and keeping Chilewa to herself. She won't let anyone touch her new offspring. Inquisitive little Kabeti gets a sharp nip for coming too close. But she retaliates with a rebellious kick. It occurred to me that perhaps Kitobu's overprotectiveness was not the best thing for Talewa. She was clearly missing out on all the social interaction Wenzi was enjoying, and I wondered how this would affect her in the long run. As for Kabeti, her mother wasn't paying her very much attention at all, so she was increasingly hanging out with the youngsters. And in particular, Pumzi, a boisterous little 18-month-old male. But their young friendship was about to be cut short. As Pumzi lies unnoticed by most of the troop, an adult male, Kona, lingers by the body. His reaction takes Holly by surprise. He stood by the body for a long time and he kept sort of looking around and, and, and obviously very distraught, but obviously protecting it, but also kind of looking for, almost like for help. You know, the troop were moving on and I think he was trying to keep track of where they were, but he also didn't want to leave Pumsy. Even Pumsy's mother has moved on, unaware of the accident. When I came to get a closer look, I wanted to do a bit of filming. Kona threatened me and I've never seen that happen before. I've never had a baboon actually threatened me and he barked threat and he and he stared and um, it was very clear that I was not allowed to come near that baboon so I, once I stepped back a bit he was fine and you know I could tell I wasn't in danger but he, he didn't want me to come close to me. We'll never know for sure but I often wonder if Kona thought he was Pumsy's father. The dry season has reached its extreme. Daytime temperature now regularly tops 40 degrees Celsius. In a desperate search for food and water, the Varemba troop has headed into the hills far from the center of their home range. For Holly and the Rangers, this means the daily slog is even harder and longer. I was becoming increasingly concerned for the troop, and in particular the young ones. The long treks were exhausting for them, and with so little food and water, they were becoming weaker by the day. I started to fear what I might see each morning. 
Every decision Hashima makes is now one of life or death. While she considers her next move, the stress of competing for food is showing in the ranks. Carrying little fat, the baboons have to find sufficient food now or they'll die. Hashima reaches her decision and in doing so hands Kitovu and the other troop members a serious dilemma. How hard can they push themselves to reach food and water? Too hard and they may die from exhaustion. If they rest too long, the weaker ones will starve. They press on. When Holly and William catch up with them, they discover another disaster. Kibeti has fallen from a tree. It made me feel sick to even look. Her leg was hanging lifelessly from its socket. She was clearly in a state of shock as she clung to her mother. It seemed inevitable now that her days were numbered. Surely she couldn't survive at such a young age with an injury like that. To make matters worse, her mother couldn't nurse her properly as she'd come into season again and the males weren't giving her a moment's peace. <laughs> Neglected by her mother, Kabeti struggles to find comfort in the troop a few yards away. But they move off, and she's unable to keep up with them. If they slip away from her, she'll not survive out here for long. Time is running out for the rest of the troop, too. They follow Hashima as she heads out in front. Her priority to find food for herself and her baby Muenzi. Where was she taking us? We were now miles into unfamiliar territory. I later discovered that she was the only member of the troop who had been here before, and that was nine years ago. Hashima has brought them to a wooded hillside that she visited when she was young. Remote and almost impossible to get to, she finds a route along paths cleared by fire. Her decision was right. The exhausted troop are rewarded with a woodland floor scattered with highly nutritious Brachistegia seeds. Ravenous, they cram in as much as they can. But for little Kibeti, the struggle for survival continues. She's lost lower down the hillside. And this is no place to be separated from your mother. One of the adult males has caught a baby antelope. He warns off the others with aggressive stares. Baboons don't actively hunt, but when food is scarce, they'll grab any opportunity that presents itself. This small animal will provide all the nutrients he needs in one package. The male is fiercely protective of his kill, although his stomach will only allow him to eat a very small part of it. What he can't manage will fall to the rest of the troop. Meanwhile, Kabeti has had a reprieve. When her mother realizes that she's no longer with the troop, she returns to collect her. With her stomach full at last, it was good to see baby Mwenzi bonding well with her mother Hashima in the lower ranks and playing happily with other members of the troop. It was a different story with Chalewa, though, who was showing all the signs of being a right royal brat. She'd have to go out of this. When she becomes the dominant female, she'll affect the troop's survival. That was an incredibly large tantrum on Chalewa's part. And it was, it was sort of just like something you'd see in the supermarket. Kid gets mad, wants to be carried, mom wants to ignore the child, it throws itself on the ground and screams a lot. But also, uh, Kitova was a little heavy-handed with Chilewa, and just before Chilewa had her little tantrum, she'd uh, bit Chilewa's hand. I think Chilewa was, was wanting to ride, and Kitova was like, no, you're going to get down. So, um, that was interesting to see. By mid-afternoon, as the temperature soars to 36 degrees, Kitovu and Hashima lead the troop back down the hill. Somehow, Hashima had pulled it off yet again. 
Not only had she found food, but now water as well. Although I knew her instinct was solely for herself and Wednesday, her actions had saved the rest of the trip too. But that still doesn't earn her the right to quench her thirst before the others. And she's chased off. Competition is fierce, and rank is exerted throughout the troop. She'll have to wait her turn. Another hard day draws to a close. The troopers covered ten miles, but thanks to Hashima's amazing memory, they will survive another night. As I watched Katashima resting with their new infants, I began to realize that the experience of motherhood was a new burden for them both, and divisions of rank has little to do with it. I could see how well this group living thing worked. Each individual has its place, but everyone succeeds. At moments like these, it was like one big happy family. And after nine months here, I was missing my own. <laughs> Over the next few weeks, the troop becomes increasingly difficult to find. They've now traveled well beyond their home range, and days pass when they can't be found at all. Vehicles can't reach this area, so Holly and the rangers are forced to walk four miles before they can even start searching. When we finally found the troop, I was anxious to see if little Kibeti was with them, and was amazed to find that not only had she somehow managed to keep up, but her leg was almost healed. A human wouldn't be back on their feet so quickly. Her resilience had astounded me yet again. But I was still concerned about the fate of the troop as a whole. If the rains didn't come soon, surely starvation was inevitable. Fortunately, we didn't have to wait much longer. As you can see, we're having a horrendous storm. It's, uh, pretty freaky. We've actually put some buckets outside because, ironically, we've been out of water for about a week, so... We're kind of looking forward to some nice fresh rain. Oh, God. Oh, dear. Whoa. Oh, God. I'm scared. The thing that really sucks about this is that we have to get up at 5 in the morning, even if it rains like this all night. So I don't know how we're going to get sleep, but I don't even know if you can hear me. But for the next five days, the troop disappears completely. Driven by the desperate need for food, Kitovu and Hashima have led them many miles further east into new territory. Charles finally finds them late one afternoon sheltering in trees, hungry and exhausted. Unable to venture far, they huddle closely together to conserve warmth and energy. But Hashima won't rest. She knows that this rain will bring a change in fortune if they can just hang on a little longer. She plans her next move. rejuvenated land. But still the troop does not return to its usual home range. Kitovu and Hashima continue to lead them east. The abundant fruits of spring have finally begun to appear. The sausage tree provides them with their first and very welcome meal. The troop now had eight new infants five boisterous males, and our three females, who I hoped would mature into adulthood to take their places in the veranda line. Good old Jogo was there looking after all of them. Unlike the females, he won't stay in the troop forever. He'll eventually go off and find another troop, or perhaps grow old and one day just won't be there. That will be a sad day. 
coping just fine with half a tail and her leg completely healed, it was great to see Corbetti in perfect health at last. She was now a happy, independent little youngster with a lifelong place in the middle ranks of the Varamba troop. Holly's year has now come full circle. She'll shortly return home to Alaska and will be replaced by another eager volunteer. I had hoped to see them return to the area where I first met them, but it turned out not to be. They'd decided to stay where the promise of food was better. I hoped they'd thrive here. I could look at Hashima and Kotobu in a new light now. Kotobu had shown that life at the top may have its perks, but motherhood is tough no matter what your status. Little Chilewa was still quite a handful. I wondered what kind of leader she'd go up to be. These ladies had shown me that living in a group can work if you all cooperate. Although they compete for food, water, and sex, their inherited hierarchy means they each get a share, so there's little need to fight. Everyone has their place, and it's not so bad to be at the bottom. You know, after it all, Hashima and Wenzi do just fine. They'd made it through the year okay. Their teamwork had protected them from predators and allowed them to find enough food for everyone. Such a simple system. Perhaps there's a lesson in there somewhere. Tomorrow I won't be here, and I don't think the boons will notice at all. I won't be here to laugh at them and to get upset when the males fight. And their life will go on as usual. And I'll just have to hope that I can remember these moments. Forever, because I don't think they will. <laughs> I can't describe the emotion I feel around them. It's not like they're my friends. Uh, but I really care for them. I know it's sappy, but it's, you can't not watch them every day of their lives. They play together now, but one day Jilewa and Mwenzi will take their places at the top and bottom of the troop. Holly won't be here to witness it, but the future of the Varamba troop will be in their hands.